Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue this series of messages on Sound the Battle Cry, I want to start today by talking about opposites. Heaven and hell, to be exact. Tell me about heaven. What do you know? What do you think of when you think of heaven? You know, if you could honestly get a glimpse of heaven, it would be impossible for you to fully convey what you've seen in human words. Human words and human images fall short of helping us understand the glory and the beauty and the grandeur of heaven itself. I mean, all the images we're given in the Bible of heaven are, are to tell us that it is so wonderful, it's beyond our ability to fully grasp. I mean, think about it. What would it be like to go back to the Garden of Eden? To live in that time of holiness and purity with God walking with us. Or go to the other end of history, to the marriage feast of the Lamb, where we sit at the great banquet table as Christ has come and taken us home to be with Him forever and experience His blessings. Or to live in that great mansion with many rooms that He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am there you will be also, that we're living with Him in that place He's prepared. Can you imagine dipping your hand into the cold river of life and drinking of it? Or walking on the streets of gold, plucking a piece of fruit from the tree of life, and taking a bite and feeling life rush through your body? I mean, what would it be like to live where there's no more tears, no more sadness, no more suffering, no more heartache? Pretty good, isn't it? And then to realize that on top of all that, we're living in the presence of God. The place where we will see Him face to face. Where we will look upon the face of God and see Him smile. Where we will feel His touch, experience His embrace. Heaven is richness, heaven is fullness, heaven is life, heaven is blessing, heaven is glorious, heaven is being in the presence of our loving God and having Him pour out His blessings upon us forever. How can human words describe that? It's wonderful. Now tell me about the opposite. Tell me about hell. What is it like? Take everything I've just said about heaven and turn it upside down. Heaven is separation from God. Heaven is judgment. Heaven is emptiness. What? I'm sorry, hell. I'm sorry. Hell. Hell is emptiness. Hell is the opposite of heaven. Hell is lifelessness. Hell is judgment. It's nothingness. It's pain. It's anguish. Hell is the opposite of everything that heaven is. It's desolation. It's emptiness. It's wanting. It's yearning. It's agony. Hell is everything, heaven is not. So, here's a challenging one for you. Put yourself in the devil's place for a minute. I know it's hard to do, but put yourself in the devil's place. Was he wanting, was the devil and the fallen, and the demons, the fallen angels, when they rebelled against God, were they wanting emptiness? Were they wanting desolation? Were they yearning for judgment? Were they wanting the absence of life? What what did they want when they rebelled? They wanted all the glory of heaven just without God. And when they rebelled against God, He gave them exactly what they deserved. They were cast into nothingness. They exist, but they really don't have life. 
as we would understand it, because they have an existence, but they're separated from the source of life, because they're separated from God. And they live in this continual place of want and yearning and emptiness and dread and desire that can never be satisfied. That is not what the devil was looking for, but it's what he got. And everything we've talked about in this series so far has talked about the fact that when the devil led Adam and Eve into sin, and sin became a reality in this world, this world, this earth, became his dominion. It became everything opposite of what God created it to be. It became a place of suffering, a place of heartache, a place of want, a place of yearning and emptiness a place of sadness, grief, despair, and heartache. It became everything opposite of what God created it to be, and this world is Satan's dominion. The Bible is clear on that. He is the God of this world. He rules over this creation, and it is a place of pain, suffering, heartache, and despair. Look at our prayer list today. Pain, suffering, heartache, and despair, just on our prayer list. It's real. Now, I want to share something with you that, that is a little bit outside the box, and if you agree with me, fine. If you don't, you can tell me afterwards you didn't agree with me, because this is one of those things I wouldn't stake all my life on, but I think it's accurate. I think it is, okay? The devil did not want to give up heaven. He wanted the lushness. He wanted the life. He wanted the splendor. He wanted the glory. He got nothingness. But he yearns for what he lost. The fallen angels learn for what they lost. Who are you? You are a child of God. Every human being in this world is created in the image of God. Do you believe that? Every human being in this world is the focus of God's heart. Do you believe that? Every human being is someone that God desires to save. And as long as there is breath in their lungs, God is working to redeem them and save them and take them to heaven. And human beings are the closest touchstone to what the devil lost in this world. Listen to the passage. Now, when an un- this is Jesus talking. Now, when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. A desert, desolate, barren wasteland, that is the existence of Lucifer and the demons, the angels that fell. Human beings in this world are the closest touchstone to heaven that the devil and his angels can get. Jesus spoke to the man who was possessed by legion. You remember what they asked? Please don't cast us out into nothingness. Let us go into the pigs, because even pigs were more desirable than the nothingness of their existence. The devil doesn't want you. He wants to use you. He wants to use the people of this world because it's the closest thing he can get to what he lost. This world is everything opposite of what God created it to be. Barren, desolate, full of heartache and pain. It is a miserable place, and the devil reigns over the ashes of his kingdom. It's a horrible place. I haven't painted a very pretty picture, have I? You remember the movie The Lion King? I I find that most adults like The Lion King as much as kids do. Remember when Simba's father takes him out and shows him the pride land, how beautiful and lush and alive it is. And then when he comes back from his time of exile when Scar has been reigning, what does the pride land look like? It's barren, waterless, lifeless, and dead. That is what the world has become because of sin, because of what the devil has done. But what was God's promise? God promised he was going to do something different. God promised he was going to make things right. I want to share a couple of Old Testament prophecies that point to what God was going to do using the imagery we're talking about, both out of Isaiah. 
I will open rivers on the, on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. And again, behold, I'm doing something new. Now it will spring up. Will you not be aware of it? I'll even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. God was going to do something new, something great, something unheard of. He was going to bring new life in the midst of the place of death. Like rivers of water in the desert, new life would spring forth where there had been nothing but desolation, emptiness, and hopelessness. The devil understood this. He knew that promise that was spoken way back in the garden, that God was going to be the one who stepped up and rectified, who dealt with what the devil had done. And when God accomplished his great work, the serpent's head would be crushed, the devil would be defeated, and life would be restored. That's pictured for us all the way through the Old Testament. We get these pictures, like, like all the images of, of what heaven would be like. We get pictures of this life being restored. The children of Israel experienced this, and one of the greatest pictures was the, the reading that was given just a minute ago out of Corinthians. 430 years in bondage to an evil taskmaster, enslaved with hopelessness and despair. All they could look forward to was harshness, burden, want, emptiness, and death. That's all they had until God came and miraculously intervened and delivered them out of their bondage. And how were they delivered from bondage into freedom? The Apostle Paul writes, For I did not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses and the cloud and the sea and they ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for they were all drinking from the same spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. The image of water, of life coming in the desert, of refreshing life in the parched dry land. They passed through the sea. They ate spiritual food given to them in the wilderness and they drank from the rock that followed them that they might have life. And Paul says in all of it, it was Jesus. It was Christ. Paul tells us, God, this is a picture of what God has done and what God is going to do again. When Jesus, when God moved, when God finally determined to, to come into this world to rectify what sin had brought, what was the devil's response? And this is his kingdom. This is his domain. Last thing he wants is God running around. What did he do? He acted. He struck. Death. That's what the devil knows. But life. And the mothers of Bethlehem wept as the babies were slaughtered. He missed Jesus. When Jesus shows up to begin his earthly ministry, where's it at? At the River Jordan with John to be baptized. Where's the devil at? Right there. To drive him out into the wilderness to tempt him. And Jesus bore every temptation, the full pressure of every temptation the devil could bring against him. And what was the devil offering? What was it the devil was offering to Jesus? You can be king without the cross. You don't have to suffer. There has to be no heartache. I can give you the world. And Jesus could be crowned and reign over the ashes of desolation if he had but bowed and acknowledged the devil. But Jesus would not give in to the temptation. He would accomplish his mission. And having endured the temptation, he steps onto the scene and begins his public ministry. And what's his first message? What's his first sermon? Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are the weak. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Words that are like nails on a chalkboard to the devil. Because all he knows is damned are you. Damned. Damned. Damned are you. That's all the devil knows. And when the words of Jesus, blessed, were spoken, it was like rivers springing forth in the desert, bringing life to those who otherwise only knew death. Because he was giving hope. The woman at the well, been married five times, living with a man, ostracized and rejected by everyone who knew her. 
What did Jesus say to her? If you knew who it was who was speaking to you, you would ask, and he would give you rivers of living water. Why living water? Because it is the source of life in the barren, desolate land. To this foreign woman who wasn't even a Jew, Jesus revealed his true identity as the Messiah of God. The woman caught in adultery, the reading we had. She's guilty, deserving of death. True, absolutely. But what did Jesus say to her? Neither do I condemn you. Instead of judgment, words of life are given, words of hope, words that transform and bring forth something new. We could talk about this with everyone, every character in the Bible. We could talk about it with, with Peter. We could talk about it with Paul. We can talk about it with Mary. We can talk about it with Zacchaeus in the tree or Matthew in his tax collecting booth. People who are trapped in the nothingness and desolation of sin receive new life from the source of life because Jesus came into this world to be the source of life for everyone. But the devil can't have that. The devil can't have God running around his kingdom messing him up. So what did he do? He acted. I want you to see this. I want you to understand this. We see throughout the entire New Testament, and I would say still today, that the demons are actively seeking to possess people because human beings are the closest touchstone to what they lost. We are moist, refreshing, nurturing life. All they know is the dryness and emptiness of death. They want to possess people. And we see that over and over again through the Scriptures that Jesus confronts that and casts them out. But only one time in the entire Bible that I know of do you have the devil himself possessing someone. Do you know when it was? And Satan entered into Judas to betray Jesus. A job too important to give to an underling. Satan possesses Judas to make sure Jesus goes to the cross. Betrayed, falsely accused, convicted, scourged, beaten, nailed to a cross. What happens to Jesus? Do we really understand what was taking place? Take everything I said at the beginning, everything I said was the opposite of heaven, everything hell is, that's what Jesus became. Do you understand that he is the source of life? He is the one who is life itself, but on the cross as he took our sin into himself and became sin for us, he was separated from God, the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was no longer acceptable. Hell is judgment. Jesus took judgment on the cross. How do we even begin to understand the eternity of judgment that sin deserves poured out in six hours on the cross as he hangs there? Hell is desolation, wantonness, emptiness, death. That is what Jesus becomes on the cross. He becomes everything opposite of God. Anger, hatred, hunger, despair, anguish, everything that is opposite of life, everything that hell is, he becomes on the cross. And the source of life himself then becomes the ultimate example of hell itself. Because what is hell other than death? And Jesus, the source of life, dies on the cross. Do you understand? Everything hell is, Jesus became. Why? Because he wants you because he loves you, because he would not let you go. 
when Jesus rose off the stone-cold slab in the tomb and stepped forth, it was like rivers rushing into the desert. It was life moving forward into the midst of death. It was offering hope and life to all who would believe in Him. And that life has touched you. Do you understand that? The moment God worked His grace in your life, spirit, the Spirit worked faith and living water came rushing into you and lifeless gave, gave, brought forth the abundance of life. All of a sudden, you were transformed and you were changed. You have become life in the midst of this desolate, desert existence of creation. Do you understand that the source of life himself, as he sits upon his throne and reigns, the river of life that runs from him runs through you into this world. You are the hope of the world because you know the source of life that this world desperately needs. This world is nothing but a desolate, dark, stark reality except for the fact that you are the hope of the world because God has brought his life to bear upon you. And now your existence is not one of emptiness and hopelessness and despair. You have meaning, you have purpose, you have reason for being here, and you have hope because you know where you're going. And until you get there and all the things we talked about that heaven is, you have a purpose. We're told we're in this world but not of this world. We've been redeemed out of this world. We are God's people interjected into this world. We are in the enemy territory. But while he is still spouting forth lifelessness and death, we give hope and life to the world. That is who we are. And that is what we are about. We have come into this world as God's people. And God is using us like streams of water in the desert to bring life where there's been only death. We give hope instead of despair. Blessing instead of curses. How do we do that? It's easy. We simply give Jesus to the world. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and to life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.